Our guest tonight probably has more experience in more areas than anyone else you've been exposed to this semester or probably even prior. Um, his name is Mark Robinson and he is currently uh, at 300 Entertainment. He's the Senior VP of Business and, and Legal. Um, 300 Entertainment is one of those newer labels that flies against what was conventional wisdom on these major label situations. Uh, we'll get into that, but that's why I thought it would be really interesting to hear about the new way, new way of doing business and not you know, st stuck in the traditional way. However, um, as Mark will share with you, he did grow up and worked his way and escaped the traditional um, companies, uh, but he cut his teeth in a lot of them and probably learned a lot of things right and a lot of things that were probably not done in the best possible way. So as I always do, I, I ask our guests to start talking about when they were sitting in a chair like that and how did they get their first start um, in the business and talk about their career path. So you grew up in northern Jersey in Bergen County. I am. I'm a local, local guy. Still a local guy. Still a local guy. Still a Jersey guy. So um, when you graduated high school, uh, so I graduated from Dumont High School. I went to uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst, undergrad. Uh, I wanted to be in marketing. Nice. I did that for about six years, bounced around different places. Uh, actually, my first job was at the New Jersey Devils, selling season tickets uh, for no money. And I got a little taste of, of the entertainment side of the business. Showbiz. Showbiz. And I was like, huh. You know, this, this is a bit more exciting than what my friends were doing. Uh, but it didn't pay, and I wanted to eventually move out of my house. Uh, so I decided to go, go to law school after six years of working. And in law school, I had no aspirations of being in the music industry. I know a lot of people go into it and say, I want to be an en entertainment, lawyer. entertainment lawyer. That wasn't me. My thing was trademarks. And I wrote a paper that got published. Uh, it had to do with the Brooklyn Dodgers and a bar in Brooklyn called the Brooklyn Dodger. And it became this big case and it got published in a law review and uh, I was going to be a trademark lawyer. Where'd you go to law school? At locally Seton Hall uh, in Newark. Yeah. And uh, what happened was there was a, a person in actually in Wayne, New Jersey named Jewel Zallen who contacted the school and said, hey, I have some interesting work. Do you have a trademark guy that wants to volunteer? So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And turned out that he represented Van Halen and Nine Inch Nails for their trademarks. Wow. So hey, he worked for a company, Nice Man Merchandising, and my job was to go to the Meadowlands or the Nassau Coliseum and sit in the parking lot until the illegal t-shirts came in. And, and we, we had a blanket injunction, we'd had the U.S. Marshals, and we busted everybody for the t-shirts. I was like, ah, oh, this is great. This is better than, you know, writing briefs. So now I had, had the, a taste of it. And uh, he ended up hiring me after law school. And under, understand dealing with bootleggers, you know, the goal was to stop the illegal t-shirts. It was very hard for him to collect money on them. Right. So uh, he, you know, Friday would come and he'd say, I, I can't pay you this week. So here I am back like I have this cool job, but I wasn't getting paid. Uh, at the time, I had a friend who, who worked at a small boutique entertainment law firm. His name is Phil Kernett. And I met with Phil, and, he, and when I was telling him I wasn't getting paid, and he said, look, I have a new client. Why don't you come and meet with me? So I sat and met with him, and he said, I have a new client, Walter Yetnikoff. Walter Yetnikoff was, is one of these legendary guys. He uh, used to run Sony. And me not knowing anything said, oh, is that some Russian musician? And he, gl he glared at me, and he pulled out the book, Hitman. And he said, read this, come back in a week. And you should all read Hitman. So you probably know Hitman very well. You lived right through it. Uh, and, and Walter also eventually put his own bio out. Yeah. Yeah, and howling at the howling at the moon. Right. You know, so I got hired at this boutique law firm. 
Walter Yetnikoff, this legendary guy, is forming a record label called Bell Bell Records. This is, so this is after Walter left Sony? Yeah, he, he, was, he left Sony. His, his non-compete was over. He decided he was going to get back into it. And Phil became head of business affairs for this record label, and he took me in as his junior guy. Right. Uh, Walter, you know, after a little bit of time, he decided, you know what, what am I doing? Uh, I just want to take my money that I got from Sony and get out of it. So he sold the company to, a, to a, another label called, uh, it was called Koch, which is now E1, which is a big independent record label. And I go into Koch with Phil. First thing they do is fire Phil, because he's making a lot of money. And they said, you're the new head of business affairs, and I'm making you know, $20,000. Uh, I was like, OK. You know, I've never even talked to a lawyer on the outside. It's a singer-songwriter label. They didn't do too much. They put out Pokemon albums that sold, and, and wrestling albums that sold millions of copies. But it was, it was, I was like, I could do this. So about six months in, we decided we're going to be a hardcore hip-hop label. Right. And my first deal was with uh, Suge Knight at Death Row Records. So you can imagine my life changed. <laughs> so I went from dealing with, you know, Pokemon to... Suge. To Suge. And it was, it was real. And, it, and, it, and I got crazy stories. I had a button under my desk that went to the police department. Uh, I had guys running up with, with guns and all sorts of things. And it got to a point where I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to do real estate law in New Jersey. Because... <laughs> It's, it's not worth it. You know, it was like my, my, I had to unlist my number. It was, it was bad. Yeah. Then I got a phone call from Todd Moskowitz, who is a guy in the business. He said, we hear you're the indie guy out there. You're the indie hip-hop guy. Lior Cohn, founder of Def Jam, one of the founders, is coming over to Warner Music Group. He's going to run Warner, and we're starting an indie division. And just so you know what indie is, you know, there's, at the time, there were four majors. It's uh, Sony, Universal, Warner Music Group, and BMG. Now there's three with consolidation, which is Warner, Sony, and Universal. So they offered me the job. I walked into my boss, and I said, listen, I love you, but the Yankees just called. I'm out of here. So I went over to Warner, and... You know, at, at Koch, it was, we did so many deals. It was, it was not about a gold or platinum record. It was about putting out as much as possible, you know, to, to make the sales. So at Warner, I didn't have that many signings, but everything we put out was gold, platinum from, you know, we started off, we signed all, everybody out of Houston from, I'm going to date myself here, but like Mike Jones and Paul Wall, and we did a deal with a company called Fuel by Ramen, who ended up being bought by Atlantic Records, but it had, you know, it had, it had it, all the hot acts were coming out of there from Panic at the Disco to Paramore. Yep. And, you know, the advice that I got going into Warner was do, you know, do as much as you can, right? So uh, they started a digital label. This was 15 years ago, way ahead of time. And Jack Holzman, the, the founder of Electra Records was running it. They said, who wants to be his lawyer? I was like, I'll do that. You know, so I got to sit down with him and find out, man, what was it like when you saw Jim Morrison for the first time? And he, and he told me. And, I, and I, you know, I learned a lot from him because he's a real indie, indie-minded guy. And so, wait, excuse me just a sec. So Warner, you got hired by Lior. Yes. So Lior, I should give a little history, Lior just didn't pop up and become head of Warner's. Lior had a success, well, he started out as, if I'm not mistaken, as a tour manager yep. for Run DMC. Yep. Uh, his mother was a, a successful attorney in the hood in, I guess, L.A. And um, then he got take. then he, I guess, he got taken in by um, Rick. Rick Rubin and Russell Simmons. Simmons, when they first started Def Jam. And he became really the powerhouse they made the records and the connections, but he was the guy who did the day-to-day, -day, and he hired a young woman uh, to be his partner or his associate, Julie Greenwald, who mm -hmm. also was here. 
and then he got, I guess he got wooed away to start Def, Def Jam over at, at Universal, yep. was it? And he um, expanded the Def Jam label to include a lot of pop and rock stuff. Um, I think Justin Bieber was maybe under yeah, it was, his... It was Island, Island Def Jam, and they had everything from Bon Jovi to Sum 41 to Justin Bieber, all everything. But he had this amazing, successful track record, and when the position opened at Warner's, they offered him whatever they needed to get him to move, so he's running now Warner as the head. So he went from Universal to Warner, and now he's rebuilding Warner, because Warner had lost its... It, it had some really successful guys... Um, like Mo Austin, Russ Tyrett. These are people who really put Warners on the map back in the day, but they wanted to continue that legacy. So they brought him over to Warners, and he's retooling the Warner label uh, under the direction of, it was bought by, it was sold by Time Warner over to, that, to the Russian, right? Well, first, Edgar Brofman. Ed, that's right. Edgar Ed, Brofman. That's right. Edgar bought it. Edgar had bought Universal, and then now, now he's buying, then he left there, and sold out and then he started Warner and he, and he brought Lior over. Yeah. And then... And, and Kevin Lyles was also over there. He brought, he's very loyal and he brought all those people with him. He brought Julie Greenwald, who's still there today and she uh, is the head of Atlantic Records and is extraordinarily successful. A lot of people thought she was going to leave and go with Lior, but as fate has it, they did reconnect years later, but I'm not going to get into that. This, that's part of his story. But so anyway, so Lior, who knew you, brought you over to. Well, actually, he, Le, Lior didn't know me. They just knew of me. They knew. Yeah, well, they, they, they knew you anyone that they did a show. deal with Death Row because nobody would touch Death Row. And plus, our strategy at Koch at the time was the major record labels were dropping artists that only sold 300,000 units. Only. Only. So we said, great, we'll sign them, and. Once we get to 100, 200,000 units, we would stop spending money and move on to the next thing. And that was, the, that was their business model. So you were the ballsy, intelligent, white, hip-hop lawyer. Yeah. And perfect for what Lior... Well, when, like. when he hired me, you know, he was the last person I met there, and he said, if I, if I hire you, I never want you to think like a major. And I looked at him, I said, I don't know what that means. I never worked for a major. And he slammed the table, and he said, you're hired. So now I'm in, in the Warner system. I, 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 we have great success. We start Asylum Records there, which was an old Geffen label that they resurrected. Yeah. Uh, I became head of business affairs for ADA, which is their independent distribution arm. Uh, they started a, a YouTube division. Like anything I could get my hands on, I became part of. Eventually, Asylum became part of Warner Brothers. Right. And... Uh, at the time, my boss, I said, I don't really want to move to California. And I got a call from John Esposito, who used to run their distribution. He just moved to Nashville to run their Nashville division. And he's like, dude, you coming to Nashville? I said, nope. He said, fine, you could be head of business affairs from New York. So I would go to Nashville once a month. And we had a great run, you know, signing Blake Shelton, like uh, Hunter Hayes, Dan and Shea. I don't know if there's any country fans out here, but... They, they've done really well. He's, he's put them on the map. So yep. I was there for a good 10 years, maybe a little bit longer. And mind you, the music industry was gloom and doom. Everybody was just waiting for it all to end and they were going to just fire us all. And I was coming to the end of the year and I got a call from BMG. Now BMG was a major record label that got purchased by Sony. But they, Bertelsmann, is, it was the parent company, they decided to come back into the music fold, in, first in publishing and then records. So they reached out to me and they said, we, your name's come up for a big job here. I said, what is it? They said, general counsel at BMG. I said, yeah, I'll talk to you for that. And they offered me the job and uh, I, left, I left Warner and went over to BMG. Now BMG was like a startup, but a startup was Lior gone by then? Lior, Lior was gone. The people that brought me into to Warner had all been blown out. They all were let go. There was new ownership with Lem Blavatnik. And the guy who owns it now, he's a Russian multi-billionaire, I guess, whatever you'd call him. Yeah. 
And, and BMG is a German company that bought years ago what was then RCA, and they were very successful in Europe as a book publisher, right? They, yeah. That was their thing, and they got involved in, over the years in the music business, but never, I don't know, they never seemed to really, really have their foot in it. They were sort of into it, um, and they had, you know, they had David Bowie, and they had John Denver, and they had things come and go all the time. Uh, and then they decided they wouldn't want to be in the music business anymore, and they sold out to Sony. So Sony absorbed all those assets, and then... Yeah, then they restarted, and they, they had a lot of money from Burlesman, and they started acquiring publishing companies. Uh, you know, they bought Cherry Lane, and they... they Bug Music, you know, there was a... a, a Chrysalis. Chrysalis, that was a huge one. And at the same time, they, they wanted to get into the record business also, which, which followed. And they, I was there for just about four years, and we did nine acquisitions from S-Curve Records to Rise Records, Vagrant. Uh, anything that moved, they wanted to buy. So what I found myself was as general counsel, which was a much bigger job, and I had a big staff, but I was reporting to Berlin, and I wasn't... I wasn't in the game anymore. I was doing, I was an M&A lawyer acquiring labels. Admin. Yeah, it was, I was directing outside counsel to, you know, on the purchases, but it was, I didn't feel like I was in it. But I was well compensated. It was a big job. I was learning different, different new things, which, you know, after as long as I've been in it, it's not easy to find a job that you start finding where you can keep learning. So it's about Four years in, I get a, a text out of the blue from Kevin Lyles, and it said, we're ready. And I'm like, you're ready for what? He said, we're ready for you to come home. And I was like, <laughs> what does that mean? And he just wrote dollar signs. And I said, oh. So got together with him. And you know, every senior person at 300 Entertainment were people I work with in the past. So one advice I give you, you're going to have hopefully not that many jobs, but always leave on a good note because you just don't know. So or the company from Lior to Kevin Lyles to, to they mentioned Salim, these are, these were all people that I work with. Our head of finance is, uh, is, is the son of somebody from Warner that I worked with. So this was a no-brainer. I was going to get back in with these guys that in a, in a different age, uh, I walked in the building and it wasn't like who was I going to eat lunch with. It was high fives down the hallway, like look, look, look who's back. Uh, which leads me to 300. And you know, 300 is an interesting company because I've always worked at places that were built from based on physical. Even BMG in their reincarnation, even though they're a new company, they still built it how they ran it previously. 300. It's 88% uh, streaming. We don't put out physical unless it's something that's huge where it may be vinyl. We don't put out CDs. Uh, in three and a half years, the company has sold 20 billion streams, seven, over 70 gold or platinum releases. Uh, it's, it's remarkable. And, and for me to go in there, I'm not just the lawyer. I'm the business affairs guy where I'm in every streaming meeting, every marketing meeting, every, every meeting, and help running the company. You're, you're getting your hands dirty again, which is what you like. Yeah, and you know what Lior asked me to do? He said, I want you to keep shooting with no safety. He said, you're not always going to hit, but you're going to hit most of the time. So he wants me out there signing deals and just being in it, uh, which is great. I, I'm, I get up early to go to work now where I wasn't doing that at, at some of the other jobs. So before you went to rejoin the, the guys at 300, you were involved in a major, major thing that I guess is held in the canons of copyright law as something that was groundbreaking, if that's possible. Um, yeah, it, it, huge. This is BMG uh, sued a... Uh, internet provider, Cox Communication. A cable company too, right? Yeah. Some of you might, I don't know who your cable 
It's like the equivalent of not a quite as big, but soon, you know, Verizon, yeah. which nobody, you know, nobody would do that. And under the copyright law, these providers have uh, what they call safe harbor, where if somebody's doing, an, if you're on, on using your internet for illegal file sharing, they have some protection uh, that we can't just sue a Verizon. There's certain things that have to happen. And what happened with Cox is that BMG sent them, you know, don't hold me to the number, but millions of takedown notices. We had a company that could see the illegal file sharing. And we sent, you know, millions upon millions of takedown notices. And what they're supposed to do under, under the copyright law is they put, put you on notice and then it goes back and forth and you have a chance to say why it's legal. But they just ignored them. They threw them all out. So we got to a point where we were like, you know what? Enough is enough. And we, we took them to court. And, and we won. And it was, it was a huge decision. It was a $25 million decision uh, plus legal fees. And it was just a seminal case. Like, this will be up there with, you know, Gokester and all these big cases. This will be that case. And they recently appealed, and BMG lost on the appeal because I wasn't there. Uh, I'm kidding. So BMG lost not on, on the, the law, just on the the damages. So the law will still be good. It's just the amount of money that... They get something? That, that, well, they're, they'll end up settling it. They're not going to retry it. So it, it won't be $25 million, but it will be millions. Uh, you know, and it was just a, just a huge, huge case. And, it, you know, we, we were fortunate, and not everybody at BMG believed in it. And I had a team, my team, and uh, we just stuck with it. It took several years. So the stuff that was illegally handled, was it publishing assets, or was it? It was, pu it was publishing assets, yeah. Because then the, the, the copyright holder could have also sued, right? The owner of the actual... The, mas the master. master, yeah, and we tried to bring in the RIAA, and they didn't want to touch it. I Why? think that uh, they were afraid it was going to be too expensive, and I think that now they're now after they they wanted somebody else to open the door. Now I think they have some cases out there that with a similar, you know, uh, legal analysis. So, so what happens to the illegal user or file sharer that initiated the action? in that kind of situation? Well, I mean, what we were trying to do is s just stop the infringing. I mean, what they're supposed right. to do is if you're a repeat infringer, you're supposed to be cut off from the service. Right. And what Cox Communication did was, you know, and we found all the emails once we got to Discovery, and it, from their head of compliance, the email said, hey, after all, these are paying customers. Turn them off for an hour and then turn them back on. Fuck the DMCA. Wow. Like that came out in court and they were like, are you kidding me? Like, and we, we were like, oh my God, like we had no idea it was going to be like, like that, you know? So they were, you know, and they were very arrogant. They were the big company. They were just like, they, they came to us the day before court and wanted to settle. I said, you know, for nuisance factor, we're, we'll give you, you know, $500,000. And at that point we knew we had them. And right. we, we said, you know what? We're going to roll this one and see what happens. You know, it, it, will, it will settle out. There's no way they're going to try to try so it's it. It's still again. not? It's still not settled. Uh, but, you know, it's gone up and down. I wouldn't be surprised if it does continue that this goes to the Supreme Court because it's that big. Because once this is law, this is going to affect every provider out there. Right. You know, and, and really all we were looking for is for them to put in a, a process. So sure. if you get a takedown notice, you, you, you know, you comply, you, you comply. or, or, or if, if uh, someone's an infringer a certain amount of time, then you shut them off. And it wasn't about, it wasn't about a big paycheck at the end. It was about, you know, protecting our rights and, and our writers' rights and, and artists. Why Cox? Because clearly there must have been other infringements with other ser I, uh, internet providers. Well, we, there, there were. Uh, they, they kind of 
fit, we didn't want to go after somebody. We knew that this was a big deal. We didn't want to go after a Verizon because, you know, they, they, have, they, have, they have more resources. And we didn't want to go after someone who was too small, so we, we tried to pick uh, someone who had massive infringements, but we thought were kind of in the middle. And that, that's where Cox played. So there could have been other places you guys could have gone. And, and, and we did afterwards, and they all settled very quickly. Because we, we said, hey, you're just like Cox. Uh, we could do this the hard way or do it the easy way. So that's got to weaken Cox's appeal that other people have settled. Yeah, except that they're all, you know, confidential and it doesn't get out there. And, you know, Cox does not, didn't want this to be law because now they have a problem. And so does everybody else. You know, I, I, thought, when this I went, thought it was, excuse me, I thought it was law. Well, it's still under, it's been appealed and it, I, I don't, it, it is law, but there's still an appeal. I don't think the decision is going to change just the dollar amounts. And from what I understand, publishing and master use is only the tip of the iceberg. There's, if Hollywood ever got involved, oh, it, I mean, it's... I mean, when we went for the appeal, we, we got uh, amicus briefs, which are... I, they're, they're outside companies, you know, like the, the motion picture industry might put in a brief in support of our position. They, they all came out of the woodwork because they knew how big this was. I mean, as bad as it was for the music industry, it's worse film. for film. I mean... Uh, so everybody's behind it, you know, and I was getting calls from everybody on this and, uh, you know, thank you. Thanks for you guys leading the way on this. Because it's not difficult to monitor that file sharing when it's illegal. There's services that allow you to see what's going on. Yeah, and, you know, it's funny that times have changed so much in just three years where, you know, the, the music industry fought, you know, we fought Napster, we fought everybody about file sharing and this, and now, now you can go, you can go on, get your free Spotify and listen to whatever you want, right? So that they, we think we figured it out. I don't think we're fully there, but it, it's getting healthy again. Yeah, the, I think it came out today or yesterday, IFP, the yeah. international thing that, that, you know, the streaming business is now the major source of revenue for the labels. Yes, yeah, 17 billion this past year, up 8% over last year, and that's year over year, and is predicted to keep increasing over the next. But the film business hasn't figured that out yet. No. They, they still have problems. Yeah. I also think it's a little different. You know, music, yeah. you listen to music over and over again where y you might watch a film once and that's it. Repeatability. Yeah, so, but it's interesting times, and, it, and I'm finding it that as the market has gotten healthy, our deals are much more competitive. Our hiring uh, executives has become very competitive where we get poached. We have a lot of young kids that work for us. Uh, and the deals, it's especially on the urban side where you know someone puts something up on SoundCloud and it starts raising its hand. If we don't go in there right away, Boom. It's, it becomes a bidding war. And Interscope's in, Def Jam's in, RCA's in, and it's amazing how fast we can get music up. I, I had one deal where we found the act on a Sunday, signed them by a Tuesday, and mu had music up by the next Friday. And as you said, it's becoming competitive because I see now the poaching of employees between Spotify yeah. and, a and Apple. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff going on, and particularly on the urban side. Well, the, you know, the Spotify's and, and, and Apple of the world, we look at that, that as the biggest radio station right now. Right. And these playlists are so key, and there's a few tastemakers that are deciding the playlists, and it's all about relationships with those guys. They get, they, I don't know how many, you probably know better than I do, how many they get a week of new music that's coming out. How do you get on Rap Caviar, or how do you get on you know, New Music Friday, or any of those things? It's, it's, but what I found out is, we know. We have these studies that if, we approach it like a radio station. You don't want to be on Hot 97 week one. You want to get the tertiary playlist first. Right. And we know that if you're on this playlist here, there's a 67% chance that you're going to feed into this one. And if you get this one, that's going to feed into that one. And then it's a build. And, and con conventional terrestrial radio seems to be the punctuation mark at the end of the sentence. Yeah, and we still... We, we, our radio people are, are not just terrestrial radio. They're... 
they're both now. And, right. and part of their be. job, they have to be because the world's changing. So now you're the happy camper at, at 300 and things are going along okay. And then one morning you wake up to find the news that some of the, some of the home team has uh, elected to uh, do something else. So how did, yep. that, how did that work for you? Well, you know, Lior left before I got there, right before, like a month before, but he's still a majority owner of the company, but he, he's the head of global music for YouTube. Uh, you know, they, they left the company in good hands with, with Kevin Lyles, who I've known for many years, and he's just a great person to work for. The company is really strives on how they treat artists, how they treat their employees, Thank you. and they're very you know culturally aware of things going around. I mean, when I got there, the first five acts we signed, champagne on the ceiling, people smoking cigars. It was just like old school. And I said, Kevin, you do this for every artist? And he said, this may just be one another signing for us, but for, the, for that kid, this is the most important day of his life. Let's make sure he remembers it. And I was like, it wasn't like that in the other place that I was at. It was just sign them and move on to the next one, you know. Mm. So it's, it's a unique place. And they've had great success. I mean, in, in, in a very short time, uh, you know, let's say about three years, they, you know, Fetty Wap, Migos, uh, I mean, those are the two biggest ones, but those were like culturally yeah. changing releases. And, you know, I was just like, oh my God, like, you know, the first Migos record sold 11,000, the second one sold 40 million. When you only have 30 people at a company, that's, Life changing, Amazing. yeah, and uh, you know, and, the, and and they look at it as like even at the end of that year that we had Migos, they weren't at the end of the year. It wasn't pat yourself on the back. It was okay. We had a great year. What did we do wrong? What else can we do? Where are our holes? What do we need? You know, let's. And they're constantly, you know, and and it's about the brand too. You know, the three hundred brand. I see how they built Def Jam. It's it becomes this thing where. Uh, you just don't get to be on that label. Like, we got to want you. And, you know, it's, it's... And the consumer knows that there's a certain quality level with that brand. I, I think it, it, it reminds me back, not that I was lived it, but there was a time before there was the majors, they had Atlantic Records, Sire Records, uh, Electra, all these different things. They were, they were the 300s, right? And eventually the big companies came and bought them all, and that's right. how they got bigger. But... You, you see there's these small labels that are popping up that can move quick, that are built for this. You know, we're all, you know, I walked in there, I was like, I don't know what an influencer, what are you guys talking about? And, uh, you know, the way we market records is so different. Sure. But it's, you know, not that I'm that old, but for an old guy, like, it's kind of cool. You know, I'm working with all young people who are... So how many people on the staff, you said? Uh, roughly. Roughly, probably about 35. Total. So it's 35 people, and, and you mentioned earlier a number. How many gold and platinum things there were? There's over, over 70, and that's in three years, three and a half years. So with a staff of 35, you got 70. Yeah, it's, re it's remarkable, and, and you know, the, stre it's the, the stream is just, it's just crazy. You know, it's just, uh, we're able to, it's coming in so quick, you know, and Plus, ha having a Fetty or having a Migos break out is just is huge, and it's not just one song. It's, and you, you don't have the overhead with the streaming. You don't have a, a, a warehouse for physical product. You don't have the returns that you used to get. Uh, what percentage would you say of the uh, releases are physical? For us? Yeah. Maybe 5%, maybe. It's, it's tiny. Tiny. It's, 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 it's marginal. And, and that's because it's, it's probably vinyl for some of the rock acts or some of these iconic records will put out vinyl, but we're not making CDs at all. I've seen some cassette tapes made. Right. <laughs> but, that, but that's, you know, novelty stuff. So you guys aligned yourself with one of the majors for, I guess... Do I use the word distribution with Atlantic? Yeah. So you said that 
how we're all how they're all faithful and I see why people are faithful to Kevin and, and Lior. So they did a distribution deal with Julie Greenwall at Atlantic Records. In fact when I was at Warner I got to have a part of that deal only on the other side. Yeah. And it was it's a it's a really good deal. <laughs> so what what services would Atlantic provide? They don't provide any label services at all, except there's one artist that we've signed jointly, Young Thug. And for, for Thug, there's some shared services, but other than that, they provide distribution. It's a worldwide distribution deal. Uh, Atlantic Records in North America and uh, WIA, ex North America. So we go through Parlophone and uh, whatever, whatever label, depending on how niche it is. You know, we've had, not just on the urban side, we, last year we had a success on the pop side with a band called uh, Cheat Codes. A song with Demi Lovato that did really well worldwide, and uh, there were a couple other things that were huge, not in the U.S. but ex-U.S. It's become much more global. It's it's it used to be that the U.S. companies only cared about the U.S. and now when we release it, it's it it goes everywhere, you know. And we can have a, a hit with Fetty Wap in the U.K. and never even have to go there. But are there territories around the world that we're the physical still matters, so they are going to make some physical of some of your product? You know, I think that if the market called for it, we would. Uh, but I, I really haven't seen it. You know, we, we have one country artist. Country is still yeah. physical. Uh, Who's the country artist? Her name is Bailey Bryan. Young. Uh, is it Bailey? Bailey. Bailey Bryan, right. But... Uh, so it, it depends. I think I think that genre is still is still more physical. Right. Yeah. yeah. So just looking at the roster, wondering if we could talk a little bit. Oh, there's Bailey's name at the top there. Um, can you talk a little bit about it? Some of these artists. Sure. So I mean, some you might not have though. Yeah, I mean, some. some Predate some, you. Some of them are older. Some of them are uh, interesting. That Brooklyn Queen. Is a recent signing. It's uh, yeah. I don't know if you can hear this. Uh, we started an influencer label, where we're looking for the influencers out there that have musical talent. It's it's another source. So we formed a label. Brooklyn Queen is a 12 year old uh, out of Detroit, and you know she's got. You guys probably can look it up, but you know 100 million followers, and so there's a built in. Uh, fan base just from the start. Uh, you know some of the you know cheat codes I mentioned. That was a uh, is a is a dance pop act. Yep. Uh, Coheed and Cambria is an older rock act. No longer now they're on Atlantic. Uh, Creek Boys are uh, they're right there. They're they're a they're a group out of Baltimore. It's a it's like a trap trap act that's. Uh, but it's a group of like, I don't know, there's probably like 10 of them. You know, the, Hobson is an indie act that's been out there for a while. He never went through any, any label. We picked him up last year. Uh, see, so you got Fetty's up there. Uh, I, I don't know if I got to. Fetty's local. Fetty's local. Patterson, right? Right, yeah, out of Patterson. Uh, Maggie Linderman is... is uh, is a pop act. Meg Mack is from Australia. Migos, Migos is no longer on the label. They they fulfilled their their album requirement and they're now on Capitol. Uh, I'm just kind of skipping through here. Sherwood Marty's out of Louisiana. Paris is an act we just signed. He is touring with. Uh, oh, he's he's got a, he's got a big tour going on with. Uh, I have to think of it, but. He, he's, he's somebody you should, should watch. Uh, T. Grizzly out of Detroit, Young Thug, Wells is a rock act. You know, it, it's definitely uh, urban leaning, but we're trying to, to even it out. But urban, urban is the most popular genre right now in selling. And from what I recall, it's also the most streamed yeah. format. Yeah, po the Paris is on with Post Malone, which it, which for a baby act to get that, 
we met him. We thought he was a star, and we signed him that day. It was like Because if you don't move that quick. If we don't move that quick, it would be... Uh, on Interscope or somewhere else. Yeah, it would just be a feeding frenzy. And it's not that we didn't pay, but it's much easier for the majors to go out and sign 20 of the same acts. And if one of them sticks, that's great. For us, we can't afford to do that. We have to be, you know, we have really good A&R. We have got people out in the streets everywhere. And, but we're, and we're early. And we have to get in there. And, you know, a lot of artists think they can do it themselves. Some of them can, but... You know, uh, you know, Macklemore touts that he did it himself. No, he didn't. He didn't do it himself. We, I signed Macklemore, Warner's. and Warner Brothers broke him at radio. Doug Morris, who now is starting his own label again, said that it'd be hard to find an act that has broken in the traditional sense and have gold and platinum without some support or help from a major label. It was hard to find... Chance the Rapper. Right, Chance, Chance was out there, and he, he, he did it on his own, but not many, not not many, not, you know, and that's what I say. You know, you you still need the marketing machine behind you. You still need those guys that can go. If you're a radio act, to go to radio, it's uh, it's it's not that easy. Anybody can put their look. You guys can sing a song, pay twenty bucks. And put it up on DistroKid, and it'll be everywhere. But that doesn't mean anyone's going to buy it. So, is there a time where some 300 act might acquire or need to be upstreamed by the Atlantic team? No, no. I mean, we we we. So none of their promotion people need to touch your stuff. They they don't touch our stuff. Uh, we, in fact, if anything, some of their some of our promotion people work their stuff. You know, we, we've got a, a really great team, uh, especially on the, on the urban side. But look, Atlantic Records is great. Yeah, yeah. You know, and they're, they're selling Cardi B and, and, uh, Bruno. and Bruno and, and, and things like that. But they're happy to have our market share. That's what it's about. Yeah, it's about market share. And, and, and for us, it's not about market share. We actually have to, you know, when I was at Warner, everybody made their bonuses. You know, they would have their budget for the year and they'd say, we're only going to lose $40 million this year. Great, we, we <laughs> lost 38 million this year. And everybody celebrated in the hallways because you got your bonuses. Here, unless we make money, nobody gets bonuses. It's, it's just a different, different mindset. But you could get a bonus. Hmm? You can get a bonus. Yeah. 300. But the, the company's doing great. So what now becomes the future other than, you know, depending on artists you sign, it just keeps growing? It keeps growing. We keep, we're constantly signing. Uh, we started a publishing division when I got there. Uh, they, you know, record guys tend not to deal with publishing. And from, from my experience at BMG, I said we should be in the publishing business. But, you know, Fetty Wap, when he signed there, you know, they, they signed a $20,000 deal at the time. And since they renegotiated. But his publishing went to Sony ATV for $3.8 million dollars. Uh, a few years ago, and I'm sure that 300 could have acquired his publishing for another twenty thousand dollars. So, especially on these young acts that are coming through and they need more money, we're starting to acquire publishing, and also all these producers that are coming in. We're doing publishing deals. Uh, I have a, I have half of Cardi B's record in publishing, and the guys there, they were just like, "You can do that." I'm like, "Yeah, you can do that." You know, there's all these all these guys out there. They don't have publishing deals, so. We're, we're building it organically. I've, you know, we, we did a deal with Young Thug. Young Thug is on Havana. He's got a piece of that. All of a sudden, I have a portion of Havana, the biggest song of the year. And they were just like, oh my God, it's like we're gonna get an ASCAP award, you know? Like, so just, just wait, you know? Where are you guys with 360 deals? Because I know that was a thing at Warner's. Yeah, at Warner, you know, Lior was, the 360 guy. He, with an iron fist, said, if we don't get 360 rights, 360 rights, meaning not just, not just record rights, but if you're an artist, I want a piece of your touring, a piece of your merch, a piece of your fan club. We looked at it as like a mutual fund where you would never just, if you were making an investment, why would you invest in the one thing that's declining and, and 
the artist is able to benefit everywhere else. Right. So we were not allowed to sign things at Warner unless you got full 360 rights. I remember, you know, Drake left the building, Nicki Minaj left the building because we wouldn't do it. And he and it was that was the law. Here we're a bit more flexible, but we are getting we are getting some rights. Touring participation, uh, piece of everything else, but I don't think we would lose a deal necessarily if it was competitive over that. We're, we're very flexible. We do different types of deals. We do regular artist deals. We do distribution deals. We do licenses. It depends, you know, uh, on the artist and, and, and what's coming in and what kind of heat. Well, a distribution deal by itself is possible also. For yeah. Artist. Yeah. I mean, I try not to do those. They're not, right. not as lucrative, but sometimes that's the only way if it's super competitive is that we ha we... We can be more flexible in our deals versus a major record label. Well, now you're competing. You mentioned Interscope, but Death Jam's back in the game in a big way with Paul Rosenberg. I mean, he not only is he an attorney, but he's also Eminem's manager. So you, you, you're banging your head against the wall with some heavy hitters. You're like the little Learjet, and you got these 747s flying all over the place, dumping a lot of cash out there, probably. Definitely. I mean, they... they I mean, we have a lot of cash, not like they have a lot of cash, but what I'll put against them any time is that I've got Kevin Lyles, I've got Lior Cohen, I've got these guys that have done it, that it's hard to match that. And that, that's not for everybody either, you know? Right. Uh, but it, it definitely helps. It, we're not just, we're just not starting from scratch. Got a substantial track record. And what, how, how many artists in there, about the two dozen? <sighs> Probably listed there. There's probably 70. Not all of them are are active. You know, uh, I don't even know how many active. But you know, it, it, a lot of it is. You know, we're not putting out full albums all the time. A lot of it's singles, EPs. It's it, it's it's about consumption in the marketplace and o always constantly putting something out there. So yeah. Uh, you know, the mixtape is a whole different thing now than it used to be. A mixtape used to be something that someone sold out of the trunk. Now a mixtape is cleared and put out and it's just kind of seeding the market, but you don't put the same kind of marketing behind it. It's kind of your playlist. Yeah, exactly. It's unbelievable. You're, what you're doing with that, with 35 people. It's, it's staggering. It really is. Uh, and, you know, and, and we're still signing and... And yet if I go to your house and I say, can I see your 300 library? You're gonna show me a hard drive. You're not gonna show me a, a bookcase with a bunch of CDs or vinyl. Nope, they're all in boxes. <laughs> Amazing. Well, <clears throat> you guys have submitted some questions, so I'm just gonna peruse through a couple of them and, and see, uh, see what we can. So Ruth says, what were your fears making the switch from where you started to where you are now? And how did you overcome the fears? Hmm. Or did you? Maybe you didn't. Well, you know, it, I've been really fortunate. There was a time when, at that first label, when Walter Yetnikoff wanted to get out, he stopped paying everybody. And... I wasn't married, I didn't have a house, I, you know, I didn't have the same kind of financial burdens on me and I stuck with it. I, I worked there for free and I just thought, well, you know, it's not, it, it, I'm in this thing that I feel that if I got out, it'd be difficult to get back in, right? So that, that was a tremendous fear. It, it worked out and it was many years where my friends from law school who were making a lot of money at white collar law firms where I was still making, you know, $20,000 a year uh, and None of them are practicing law anymore. Uh, my wife always says I'm the happiest lawyer there is. I go to work with a baseball cap and sneakers. You know, it's, uh, I get to run around. So what do you think those people are doing? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. But, you know, that was a big fear. And then, and then when I was at BMG and felt like I wasn't in it, you know, you reach a point where you think, like, I loved working at Warner. I went to BMG more for the experience and it was a big gig. And then once I got there, I was like, oh, I liked it better, like being in the trenches. So, you know, you have that fear that, that what's my next fate? I wanted to get back in 
or am I going to end up at a law firm, uh, you know, being on the other side of the deals, which I've never been really. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to mention that you were a Billboard digital power player in 2016. I was, and that was all due to the, to the Cox case. <clears throat> Do you, uh, well, <laughs> Luisa want to know if you feel that you've made a big contribution in the business of music. Well, I, I, I mean, I've probably signed more hip-hop acts than, than most in the industry. Uh, you know, that, that's really my legacy. And, and the Cox case is a big deal, but you know, I, I played a very small part in that, even though it was my department. You know, I wasn't in court you know, arguing the case, but we, we did have the courage to go forward with that, and that, that will be a legacy. Uh, but you know, I look back on, on my career, and you know, I've signed everybody from you know, all the Death Row stuff, Barney the Purple Dinosaur, uh, any, You're responsible for that. Yeah, the. the uh, but then that that spawned Denny Lovato, right? We we signed. Uh, you know, if there's any American Idol fans, there was a guy William Hung. Oh yeah. So we we would watch. This is early days, and we were watching this, and we and someone had the bright idea that we should sign that kid, and we found him, we signed him, and American Idol flipped out. <laughs> and, and they were like, you can't sign him. And I, I had a copy of his contract. And they said, you know, he's tied to American Idol. I said, well, really, I, uh, point me, in, the, point me in, the, in your deal where it says that. Because it didn't. So they ended up putting in what they call the William Hung Clause, that if you appear on camera, you're tied. They have an option for right. you. But before that, they didn't have that. You know, that all those outtakes when he went up there it was... Uh, yeah, and that, that was just a crazy ride. We sold 280,000 records. Uh, it was the wackiest deal. The, mo the mom was involved. I had to put a rider on his deal that he would only record if he got white rice, orange chicken, and a glass of water. And I was just like, are you kidding me? So I said, hold on, went back. I said, for you, I'll write that into your contract. So we wrote it into his contract. He's playing Jingle Ball, and I get a phone call at a, like 10 o'clock at night, and like, the Black Eyed Peas ate William's orange chicken. <laughs> I'm like, you're in New York City. Just go down the corner and get him some more. But uh, it was just like, that was, that was definitely a memorable one. You know, I've worked on, uh, you know, Jimmy Fallon put out a record. Uh, Three marks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, no, we put it out at... Warner Nashville in their comedy division, and it, it won a Grammy. That was a big deal. We had everybody on there from Paul McCartney to... And that was before he had his TV show, right? No, he had the TV show. He did? This was the second one. Oh, okay. And, you know, when we sat with him originally, we said, you know, Jimmy, you have all this stuff. What, what do you want out of this? He said, I just want to win a Grammy. And we won the Grammy, and we came in, we said, see? But we tell that to everybody, you know? Right. And uh, that, that was a fun one to work on. A lot of people ask this question. Janet poses the, what advice can you give to emerging artists who are trying to break into the business? And second part, what makes an artist stand out from the rest? Well, you know, I think the standing out, a lot of, uh, it, it, it all comes down to the music, but we have people that are just scouring, you know, analytics. They're seeing what's popping up. We have so many tools where we can see everything that's, going and what we we may see a song that's just performing in Memphis and our guy will just fly out there find find you in a club and we'll try to sign you but it, it's but but it's about the music first second first you know it's like what it, it, it we look for things to stand up we have people out there on the streets that are team what's popping in the clubs and things like that uh, but I think that if you're a musician you know, it's, it's super important to be out there and playing and building your fan base up. And, uh, it, and it's not easy. You know, it's not just put it up on SoundCloud and you're going to get signed, even though that happens. Most of the time, there's a lot more going around it. You know, we eventually look for people that are, you know, that are performing, that are surrounded by good people, that, are, uh, that the music's good, that there's, there's other things that are happening. We also look at, 
if, is there traction? You know, just because it's up on SoundCloud, we look at the comments, we look at what the fans are saying. Uh, is, is this real? Is this, you know, there's companies that, that buy likes and things like that. Uh, we, we have to make sure that it's, it's real. So the advice is develop some sort of following that will pique the interest of some executive somewhere. I, I think so, and I, I think you know if that's if that's what you if if that's what you want, you know. Uh, but I think that what I tell all of you, whether it's mu music or whatever your career is, if you love something and you're passionate about it, don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it. Like just you keep at it and keep knocking on those doors, and you know not everybody's going to be a, a pop star, but maybe you, maybe you get into it and and I know you end up being an entertainment lawyer. Or, or whatever, but you know, you can, you can connect the dots. Caitlin posed a bunch of questions that they all come down to the nuances and differences between being on a major and being on an indie. And she wanted to know what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of staying with an independent? Since so you've been on both sides. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, you know, it's a, it's, it's a tough question. Yeah. You know, being on an independent, there's a lot less artists, right? So we can focus more where if you're on a major, there's, you're one of, I don't know how many, and they're all going at the same time. There are some advantages being, you know, when, when Atlantic Records has a hit, it is a marketing machine. And, and you know, they have a staff of 70 people working their digital marketing department. Their radio guys can walk into a radio station and say, Hey, play this new thing because I got the new. I also have Cardi B. Like, it, there's, they're very powerful. But getting to the point where you matter is difficult with a major. With an indie, you probably have more. Yeah, we advantage. we can't afford to to sign you and not work you, and 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 try to make it work. You know, a lot a lot of majors will sign. Like I said, they they'll sign twenty acts. And they'll put you on the shelf because you know Post Malone is taking off, and we signed ten guys that look just like Post Malone because we need a you know a guy that looks like that, and he's he's now going, and you know, uh, you know, there's pluses and minuses. You know, so, sometimes an indie doesn't have great distribution. Sometimes an indie doesn't have the same kind of connections. It's one thing to put things up on Spotify and Apple. Those you know, Atlantic Warner Music Group has, you know, 10 people that sits in Cupertino in, in the Apple offices, you know, or, or at Spotify where most indies don't have that access. You know, we're, we're a little different because of the relationships that we do have. And also we can tap into some of those relationships. Uh, you know, it's, it's plus and minus. Me personally, I, I like being, I like where all the action is, I think, at, working at a major, you get more pigeonholed at, this is your job, we're here, you know, I'm in the marketing meeting, I'm in the streaming, I'm in everything. Uh, but for an artist, it's, look, a major record label may write you that first big check. Right. Right, and, you know, Migos, Migos made a lot more money with us than they would have ever made at any major, just because the deal was very aggressive. Uh, Nick says, or asks the question is, <clears throat> what would be some of the important aspects of the legal end of the music industry that an artist should be aware of? So well, there's guys like me on the other side that, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think that you need to be a smart businessman. You need to surround yourself with good people. Uh, look, when I do a deal, you know, all the deals are negotiated, but there's certain things that, a more skilled lawyer on the other side is going to pick up on and, and, and try to change the deal. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to get the best deal possible for me. You know, a good deal is both people walk away feeling a little like I didn't get everything I wanted and I, and I don't get everything I want either. Uh, but I, th I think that as an artist, you have to be educated. You can't just rely on everybody around you. You need to, to, to understand what, what does that mean if I take an advance? Or, or what, is, what does that royalty mean? Or 
uh, if I go in the studio and I'm in there for three days, all that money is going to be charged back against your account. Where some guys just go in there like, what do you mean uh, I'm negative $200,000? And it happens all the time. Uh, I, I think that, that that's the best advice is, is, you know, the best... Some of the best guys that I've worked with were these were the artists that they knew every point of their deal. They didn't just say, let the lawyer do it. They knew how much money they were owed, what their royalty was, when they were supposed to be accounted to, when they could uh, audit us. Uh, that's the best advice I could give. Okay, Gina, I want to know if you've ever had a deal with a legal issue involving one of your past companies. Yes. Uh, when I was at Asylum Records, we had to deal with a, a group called the Diplomats out of Harlem. And Koch had a deal with the Diplomats. And they were putting out records. And it got, it got ugly. And, uh, you know, and my boss was like, I don't care. You know, they're, they're not your friends. They're, they're taking money from us. And we had to go in there and go after them. And uh, it was... It settled out because of my relationships. It's all about relationships, you know. It's very rare that one record company would sue another, but it's about getting to the right person where you could sit down and say, "Listen, you know, we know what you're doing out there. We will sue you if we have to, but let's work it out." And we did. I think I try getting that across every semester to the students. Is it's a business of relationships. It's about people. So, you know, you can't piss somebody off because they could be somebody you need something from, or you meet the same people on the way up, you're gonna meet on the way down. No, and you know, from, from the lawyers I deal with, you know, yes, we, we, we battle each other, but you know, we're all just doing our jobs, and, and all the other labels, you know, especially on the urban side, there's, you know, every, every release has a side artist on there where I have to call, oh, yeah. uh, you know, Capital or, or Interscope, and, and I know the guy there and say, listen, you know what, T Grizzly's got Rich the Kid on his record. Oh, that would never happen. But, you know, it's, we have to work things out because they're going to come to us also. And it's, 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 all, right, it's all about relationships. It, my job is about relationships. I am where I am because everyone I work with were people I, I worked with at some point in my career. And like I said earlier, I always left on a good note. I always uh, kept up those relationships because you just don't know. You just don't know what twists and who's going to be where. You, you get involved with the sampling? There's no samples. No. Oh, okay. Uh, when, uh, tip, I do. Uh, typically, there, there's some outside firms that we use uh, to, to clear the samples. And I'd say most of the time we can clear them. It seems like things have opened up more than it has been in the past, just the way, you know, there's music all over YouTube, there's user-generated content. As long as the publishers are getting paid or the record companies are getting paid, they seem to be a little bit more lenient. But there's certain things that come up where if I see somebody sampled prints, I'm like, guys, just take it out because we're never gonna, we're never gonna clear it. Prints, okay. Um, what trends have you seen over your career, asks Avery? Trends? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we, we fought, the record companies fought. They were like this around the digital downloads and, you know, with Napster and everything like that. And thank God Napster happened, right? Because uh, it, it, it led to Apple, which that was a legitimate service. We were getting paid, but, but the record companies were still like this around their content. And it wasn't until it, we really hit rock bottom that they figured out a way that, wow, people are gonna listen to music for free. You know, they're, they're gonna go on YouTube and listen to music. How can, we, how can we support the artists, support us? And it was about advertising dollars. It was about subscription. And it's, it's finally crossed. And I started in 1996 at the peak of the record, com record sales. It was $25 billion business. And since I started up until about a year ago, it's been straight down. 
which, you know, which is not a good thing, you know. Uh, but fortunately, it's going back up with, with streaming, and I don't think it's fully settled out yet, but it's definitely getting healthier. And, you know, there was a time where a few years ago, if you told me you were going to the music business, I'd say run. Right. Not, not the place to be, and I wouldn't say that now. No. No. These things are starting to turn around. Um, Chris owns a independent record label and want to know what tools should an independent record label be aware of that help facilitate success? It all comes down to A&R. You know, if you find good, you know, as Leo would say, if you find good, that, that's, that's got to be the basis of your company, right? You can get distribution. That used to be the barrier to entry. Right. That's not a barrier anymore. So if you have good music, that that that's the best advice, and 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 make sure your your things are in order too. You know, there's a lot of it's the wild west out there. Mm. We have we have you know there's I'll tell you a story. There was there was a, a rapper that we were trying to sign. We couldn't find him. We found his producer, and the producer said, "Oh yeah, I know where to find him." But by the way, that hit song that he's got going, he never paid me. And he never did any paperwork with me. I said, oh, I'm your solution. I'll pay you, and you give me all the rights. And that's what we did. And then we approached the artist, and we said, you know that hit song you have? Well, we own it, and you should sign with us. Which was, it was a pretty ballsy move. He turned out not signing with us, but the label he did sign with uh, paid us handsomely. They bought the master. They bought the master. I kept the publishing. Of course you did. But, but what I would say as a label, you got to make sure you have your stuff. It, it, even though you know, we live in a world where people can put things up on the internet and, and, it, and there's user-generated content and all this stuff, the bottom line is the minute you have success, everybody will come out and sue you for sure. Inevitable. Inevitable. It's... it's you know, uh, you, you have to do things the right way. If you got a sample, you got to clear it. If you have a side art, you have to clear it. Pay your producers, get the paperwork. Uh, you, need, you need to do that, and you need to have rigor around that. Hmm. Uh, Chris also, as I said, has an independent label distributed through the orchard. Uh, wants to know how a startup company as theirs could try to facilitate investors such as Google and YouTube to get more capital and more juice? Sounds like a difficult question. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know how you get those guys interested. Uh, but there's companies like 300 that are looking to invest in the indie sector. Let me know what the label is. <laughs> no, but, but you know, you, once you have success too, People will come to you, come to you, and there, there's sometimes it's the lawyers out there. There's certain big lawyers that are connected to those kind of companies that that can can connect the dots. I mean, people, it, it, people. Look, Google, Google is, a, is is a major investor in 300. You know, and that I'm sure happened because Lior has a relationship there, or Kevin, or somebody. Or there was an investment banker that, that connected the people together. All right. Um, Gabrielle want to know, 300 Entertainment has rock bands, country artists, electronic, hip-hop. Why do you want to know why is it important for 300 to have artists that fit into so many different genres? Well, you know, you, you don't want to, well, it's a good question. I mean, we, we consciously are in the pop space. Uh, we think it's a, it's a huge area. You know, it's, it's not, for us, they, they had their first success on the urban side. And I think they just want to be more well-rounded. Uh, maybe it's not going to be like that forever. And also, there's more artists, there's more, there's more out there, right? They're, we're not competing with the same people when it comes to pop. There's a whole other slew of people, but you know, there's different lanes that we can run in uh, you know, when I was at Koch, we did everything from kids to gangster rap to whatever. 
because the majors got out of those lanes. And we said, you know what, we could be a, a, a kids label because they're not putting out kids music. So we did a deal with Sesame Street. We did a deal with Barney, a deal with the Wiggles. Like it was, you know, so I had Suge Knight here and I had the Wiggles over here. <laughs> but you know what? I've got like three platinum plaques from the Wiggles. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I didn't have to <laughs> go to radio. I went to Radio Disney and there was no tour support. It was, and they had a TV show. Sold a lot of records. No copyright or sampling issues. No, it was all like, you know. Uh, Dominique seems to know a lot about a lot of things, and she said that uh, Freddie, were, were, when he signed 300, had some legal issues with a former member and friend, P. Dice, and want to know if you were part of that, getting that straightened out. I was not. That all happened before I got there. And even if I was, I couldn't talk about it here. Uh, Kadarius, hope I'm saying your name right, um, said that when Migos left, did, was there any backlash or negative from other artists? And did it hurt you guys and your ability to get stuff done? You know, me, me, well, Migos left last October. It, no, there really wasn't. I mean, they left. They, when, you, when you sign an artist, there's a certain album commitment. You know, whether it's one album, five albums, Migos had a commitment to us that they fulfilled, so they were done. And someone came in, wrote them a huge check, and, you know, they're, they're still out there. But uh, there, was, there was no neg neg negative impact on it, you know. Look, artists inevitably get upset, you know, Young Thug gets upset all the time, and we part of our job is to kind of finesse it. And uh, you know, this week he's happy, so it, it 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 depends. It depends what's going on. I don't think there's any artist that's always always happy with their label, you know. And there's always somebody that's going to write a bigger check. And now that the market is healthy again, it's like, you know, we just put out a uh, Famous Dex record, and it's I don't you don't know who Famous Dex is. Hopefully, hopefully you guys know who Famous Dex is. But, you know, the album came out. It's doing great. The first call I got from the manager was like, yeah, we want to buy, buy out of his contract. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, that's not going to happen. They just put it out? You just put it out? Yeah, we put it out uh, two weeks ago. So why, what was his concern that somebody must have offered him more money? Yeah, Interscope came in and offered him $3 million. And I said, well, that's, that's great. He's not going to Interscope. And then, of course, I reached out to Interscope and sent him a tortious interference letter and said, if you talk Hands to off. our guys, we will come after you. Um, but that's a good problem to have. That means he's yeah. successful. So I, I, I'm OK with The compliment. It. You know, it, it, that's just part of it. Uh, Danilo wanted to know, how difficult it is to keep your content from being illegally downloaded and pirated? You know, when I was at Warner, it was such a big concern. I don't really see it now, other than, you know, occasionally there's leaks that happen where we see, this, see the content out there before a release. And we have companies that we deal with that basically I could tell them, you know, Young Thug is releasing an album on Friday. These are, these are the three songs, put it in your system, search and destroy. And they have crawlers that go through and they'll find it and they'll send out strike notices. Uh, but it's, it's not, it, it, it used to be just whack-a-mole. You know, we just couldn't, couldn't stop it. You know, BMG brought the case against Cox. You know, we're waiting to see what happens when that's all settled. You know, it, it'll give us more ammunition to, to stop that, what's out there, but it's, we're so we're so streaming centric at 300 that it's 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 out there anyway for free, right? So and I don't think that's how. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I would guess that the majority of people out here are not, you know, BitTorrent ripping things off the internet. It, you just you just listen to whatever well, we're you all listen to. Potential industry workers. So why would they want to bite the hand that's going to feed them, right? Well, I had to yell at my kids about it, you know, I was like, can you imagine if that came out that like my kid is like ripping, is one of these guys that 
uh, you know, they don't know. They've, there's a whole generation of kids coming up now that never bought music, right? It was, why would I buy music? Right. Uh, Joe Vahana wanted to know what constant mistakes do you see being made in the entertainment industry, whether it's with big companies or with the artists? You know, I, look, some, sometimes there's artists that, that just sign, sign somewhere because it's the biggest check. It may not be the best place for them to be. Uh, you know, like I said, there, I, I see artists that also don't get their house in order and they put things out without clearing it and inevitably it's their downfall. Uh, but you know, record labels, now that, now that it's, it's getting healthy again, it's, they're spending money like crazy. They're not disciplined about it. And you just hope history doesn't repeat itself, right? Mm. That, 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 that's something. You know, and I even see in our deals, we started off at deals at this level, but now to compete, we're up here. We're not always, and, and we've gone up here, but trying to stay here. Thomas wants to know, <laughs> basically he's asking you for your job description, wants to know what your day-to-day -day main responsibilities are. You know, it's, I do a lot of things. You know, it's, uh, if a deal comes in, I'll do the deal. If, if we, I have to structure a deal, we'll sit down and, and what's the best way to approach it. Uh, you know, I talk to the A&R guys and how, how they're gonna approach the artists or the managers. Uh, me, I'm involved with everything at 300 from what the 401k plan is going to be to uh, should we have an A&R plan. Uh, you know, so my day, my day can start off calm as could be and all of a sudden it's, it could be a fire drill. It's, it goes up and down. It's, you know, I, I, there was that show Vinyl that was on TV short-lived. Yeah. But I watched that show and I was like, you know what, there were things about it that because it was so chaotic that that's, my day could be very chaotic. Uh, but there's some days that it's very chill and we're just, you know. But you're not just like a lawyer. I'm not just a lawyer. You, you, you know, and, and that was the advice that Walter Yetnikoff gave me early on. He said, don't be that lawyer that sits behind the desk and pushes paper because nobody will trust you, right? He said, go out there, go to the shows. You want the artist to call you before they call someone else if, if they're in trouble or if they need, need help. And it was sound advice because I'm not seen as just, oh, that's the lawyer guy. He, you know, I'm the guy that's at the club doing shots, doing whatever. You know, it's, it, it, you're in it, you know. And you're one of the guys. I'm one of the guys. And, uh, you know, I've gotten several calls that I don't want to get from people that were in jail, from whatever, that, you know, but it's part of it, you know, and it's what, how you react and what you do when you get those calls. Um, Christian wanted to know if you had any advice to give a student who's looking to pursue a career in the law side of the music business. Well, first I'd say go to law school. Well, yeah. but, but what I would say is that, you know, it's a, it's a breakthrough industry and there's a lot of people, you know, I get resumes every day. I think the people that stand out to me are the ones that do internships. Uh, I would try to get those internships while, while you're in law school or even before because it, uh, I think anybody that goes to law school, everybody's smart, everybody gets their law degree, but like that shows me that, that somebody really wants to be in it. And I will look at those people before I look at someone that has nothing. You know, I'd much rather get a guy that's, look, I didn't go to Harvard and I worked my way up most people that are at record labels, at least at the majors, they're all, you know, Ivy League, whatever. They went to work at a big white collar law firm and then they moved over where I came through the trenches, you know, so. Uh, well, that's what makes you, you. Yeah, and it, and it makes me, I think, more nimble and more, and I, uh, more street smarts when it comes to doing the deals and things like that and being able to, as opposed to being, So calling on your legal expertise, Bianca wanted to talk to you about the Music Modernization Act that's uh, currently in Congress. I guess it's going to the House and the Senate for approval. Um, any thoughts 
if that has any impact or what it might do? Well, I, I think, you know, I think it'll have a huge impact on the publishing side. And, and I, by well, no what, actually, we should say what it is. Well, it, it's right now that, and I'm not an expert at this, but I was immersed in it at, at BMG, is that the way publishers are paid, it's all statutory. It's all, you know, the record companies can go cut a deal with Spotify where the publishing companies are stuck with a deal that's governed by the, uh, by the Copyright Act, and it sets what the rates are. And their big fight here is to say, hey, you know what? Those, those rates that were set in you know, 1922 when, when they put out you know, uh, cylinders, cylinders. Like it's, it's so antiquated. You should let us go out and be willing buyer, willing seller. Let us negotiate in the open market on what the deal should be, as opposed to having these set rates. You know, I don't know the exact figures, but the labels make, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if it's three or five times more on a sale on a stream than the publishers. You know, so there's this big disparity. Granted, the record companies are putting out the marketing money and taking the risks, but it's, it's like this, you know, and that, that act is, is going to, if it's passed, even it out. So it's, it's, it's a good thing and it will solve some problems? Yeah, and it, it'll, it'll take it, it'll, you know, right now, if, if the only way that they can change the rates is they have to sue each other and go to a, a rate court and it's, it's, it's a mess and it's a long process and it's, it's you can imagine, you know, Spotify has much different interests than a YouTube versus an Apple. Uh, and you can never get in a room and say, let's come to one deal. So I think that if that act gets back, it would be great for everybody. Well, for the content owners at least. Right. Um, Jaden wants to know how you're able to manage your day at the label and since you're involved in, as you just ex explained, how you're involved in so many different things. I guess time management tips. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a... You gotta work hard, you know, and, and, uh, and time management and working late when you have to work late and getting there early when you need to get there early. But, you know, I look at it as being involved with the other areas makes me w more well-rounded and helps me to help me be a better business affairs person there. You know, I understand what the marketing guy is doing. And a lot of times I'm sitting in those meetings because they're deciding to do some, some crazy sweepstakes. And I'm like, guys, you, you can't do a sweepstakes without clearing it with the attorney general. And it, like, don't do this. Or, or uh, you know, the artwork is about to go up and that's Young Thug's brother. It was about to go up and they didn't have a clearance on it. And we were like, well, how do we know it's really his brother? And, you know, that was something that got flagged literally 48 hours before it went live. And they scrambled and that. But, but sometimes you need an adult in the room, you know. It's moving so fast and it's, it's a lot of young people and they just don't know. And, you know, uh, from Kevin and the other senior executives, they, like, we've, we've, we've been there and... and uh, but time management, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know what, you know, right. there's, there's days that it's hard to keep up with it, but there's other days where it's, it's, it's fine. Um, let's see, William wanted to know how or in what ways did BMG separate itself from other publishing companies and the way they handled things? What made them different? Uh, you know, they're... I don't think they're that much different than any other publishing company, honestly. I think that, that they tried to pride themselves that their interface and their reporting systems and, and, and the dashboards they had. So if you were a writer, you could see how much money you were making right away. You can go online and it, what, you didn't have to wait for a statement. I think that was a way that they really tried to distinguish themselves. Uh, but, you know, they, they pride themselves on their sync department, they had 70 people. Sync is the people that take the songs and put them in the films and TV. They had 70 people that that's all they did. Right. So, 
you know, that, that was a big thing with them. But they're, you know, they're very aggressive in acquiring companies and they, they built things very quickly. I think that they need to catch up with their systems and things like that. Matthew is the one to look a little under the hood here and said, um, I want to know why Rapper Hobson signed with you guys after allegedly saying that he was retiring. I think, I don't, don't quote me, but I think that he was going to retire because he signed with Warner Brothers and he had a falling out with his partner and he wasn't going to sign, he, he stopped putting out music. And he decided he wanted to get back into it. He saw the things that 300 was doing and, uh, you know, two people put us together, we hit it off, and he decided to, to put out his last record with us. How about the only ifs, or the one that got away. Camilio said, you know, what were some of the things that you identified that you wanted to get, they weren't ready yet, or they went somewhere else? I want to know, you know, everybody... Yeah, I think everybody I, has those stories. I think everybody has those. You know, I look back when I was at Warner, and I'm dating myself, but there was a song called Hey There, Delilah by the Plain White Tees. We had it. And we, you know, when, when I was at Warner, we were in this indie division, and, and the way it worked was that we would develop it, and then we could upstream it to Atlantic or Warner Brothers. And we went to Craig Kalman, and we said, we got a hit. This is a smash. He's like, I don't, I don't hear it. Went to Tom Wally over at Warner Brothers. This is a hit. He's like, I don't, I don't feel it. So they came to us. They said, can we go to Hollywood Records? And we said, yeah. So we let it go. That whole summer, every time I turned on the radio, that's all I heard. And I just, I, it would drive me crazy. But, you know, there, there were things throughout my career where, you know, when we had have 360 rights, where we could have signed Drake. We could have signed uh, Nicki Minaj. I did a deal with Lil Wayne once, and uh, after we did the deal, we, we, paid, we gave him a check for a million dollars, went off to Christmas break, came back in January, and he said, yeah, I found another contract. Uh, cash huh. money found another contract, so I, you know, that one got away. You know, it was he, like, he gave you the money back. Yeah, he gave the money, but we kept the publishing. You so, see the pattern here. No, but but we yeah we he gave the money back. But it was there's when I, when I started at Velvel Records with the Walter Yetnikoff, uh, Chumbawamba came in. Remember that huge hit they had? Oh uh, yeah, oh yeah. And you know he, he is this older guy. He's like, what the fuck is a Chumbawamba? I'm not gonna sign that crap. And then all of a sudden it was like, who 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 is this? Walter. He's like Chumbawamba. He goes, what the hell is that? So they could have gotten them at Velvel. They were in the building, and, 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 they, and they left. You know, and he was just like, I'm not going to sign that crap. What is that? It's, it's so funny, because I, I was involved at Republic Universal, and if you told me that, anyone else told me that story, I said, that's not true. Because the other story was totally different. But. You know, I, I, <laughs> I've heard stories. You know, I run into one lawyer, and every time I see him, he, he says, uh, ask Leo about Cage the Elephant. Oh. Um, and I'm like... You know, he handed him Cage the Elephant and, and they passed on it. You know, it, everybody's got that story, but you know what? You can't worry about it. You just can't. You know, it sucks, especially when, when, if, you, if you potentially could sign it, but, uh, you know, who knows? What's the, what's the cliche? Failure is an orphan and success has many fathers. Right. You know, Rich the Kid right now is, is, is taking off at Interscope. We had Rich the Kid. We sold his contract to Interscope. We didn't believe in him. But you kept the publishing. We didn't kick the push, but we, we, but, but he went to Interscope and, you know, uh, he's having great success there. And we still, to this day, don't believe that if he stayed with us, that he would have gotten the same look that, that they were able to give him with the, putting him together with the artists that they had there. Uh, you know, there's no regrets. Can't. Any insights you can offer? Jade wanted to know about when you worked at PMG and you, were involved in the acquisition of Broken Bow, Vagrant, and S Curve, and Rise. We just want to know what were some of the. How did you help get those deals done? Uh, I mean, I mean, since I was the indie guy, I knew a lot of these guys. 
Broken Bow in particular, BMG really wanted to be in Nashville. Right. And yeah. they, they started that they were going to start a Christian label and they were going to build it from scratch. And I was like, guys, that's not how you go into Nashville. Like, go out and buy the biggest indie that's there and put a big flag in the ground. And they were like, who do you buy? I said, you buy Broken Bow. And Broken Bow was not for sale. And I got tipped off that the owner was ready to sell. And I, I called our guys, like, go in now and ask them. And, and that's how it went down. And, and they ended up buying it. You know, Rise Records, you know, that's a metal label out of Portland. They, uh, you know, that was brought to us by, by somebody in the industry. You know, a lot of the lawyers are the ones brokering these deals. Of course. So, and then we would evaluate it. Does that make sense? Does that fit? Oh, we, we already have a label like that. Uh, but BMG was a ferocious appetite. I mean, I would go, A2IM is an independent organization for all the indie labels. Right. And I would go there and I felt like I was a wolf with a sheep because I'd walk around and be like, oh, you, guys, you guys for sale? You know, we, we got a lot of money, you know, and, and every once in a while you catch one. And, uh, you know, it, it was uh, perseverance. But you know, we, we bought, like, with the publishing, like nine different labels in three years, which is, you know, of all my time at Warner, I was involved with two. And we bought Roadrunner and we bought uh, Ryko. And that was it. And, and they had all these corporate lawyers that pounced on it and they did the deal. And then Warner inevitably would take the labels and dismantle them and feed them into Atlantic or Warner Brothers or whatever. So it's just, uh, you know, that's the fate of, uh, you know. So, you know, BMG was able, because they didn't have a record division that were out, they could attract these labels in and they'd say, you know what, you're going you're gonna to be standalone. You're going to keep you intact. You just get to, to, to use our uh, infrastructure. So, you know, and they paid a lot of money for these labels. You think that's working out for them? Uh, look, they've had some success. Jason Aldean just had a number one record. Yep. Uh, S-Curve, you know, Steve Greenberg, who runs that, is, a, is a, the best music guy that's in that building, and he's had some success with uh, Andy Grammer and uh, AJR and a couple other things. Yep. You know, they're... I think if they stay the course, they'll be successful. I mean, uh, I didn't always agree with, not Steve Greenberg, some of the other people there. Uh, I had different views of, you know, we put out a Blink-182 record that did very well with Janet Jackson. They got, they got into, they wanted to sign uh, more heritage acts. You know, so we signed Nickelback and we signed this and it, You know, and when they came to me and wanted Nickelback and they were like, big rock band, Nickelback. And I said, not big rock band anymore. Right. And, you know, we did that deal for a multi-million dollar deal. They signed it the, like two days after I sent it. I said, of course they signed it. You know, no, nobody's paying that much for Nickelback. And then our radio guys went out and half the country, half the radio stations in the country were like, their slogan is radio free Nickelback. Right. Uh, so for me, per, I think that they'll be fine. For me, it wasn't, it wasn't the right fit. From my vantage point, I see... BMG, and to a lesser extent, Cobalt, being these entities that have these publishing philosophies that are radically different, but they also want to provide label services, so they're signing acts, whether it's one-offs or moving forward. And I, I just wonder what you think the difference is between b signing a, a, an artist or a record to BMG versus Cobalt. Uh, well, you know, Cobalt, dabbled in it a little bit, and then they got out, and then they, they bought AWOL, which is digital distribution, and that's where they're focused now. The, the, the president of, of BMG is now the president of, of uh, Cobalt, Laurent Hubert. Right. And they're, 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 they're a different kind of publisher, too. They're, they're not acquiring publishing rights, they're administrating rights. Right. So it's, it's a volume business. Uh, they're all about their, their platform, their interface, it's more technology driven. And where BMG is, you know, they had all publishing people running the record division. That's changing. They're bringing in more record executives, which is good. And, uh, you know, hopefully they... Is there room for both? For... Is there room for both services? Yeah, I think so. 
you know, I, they each provide a service. I, I, you know, it depends on the people that they bring in too. You know, it, it's not just about keep being able to get it up on Spotify. You know, it's about your playlist. It's about going to radio. It's about marketing ideas and things like that. Where I don't think that they they they're there yet, but anything's possible. Yeah. Okay, back to 300. <clears throat> uh, Corey wants to know about the localization of urban music. In other words, it's a global thing. And what do you see going on in, in Asia and Europe? And does that limit or does that give you the opportunity to take some of the artists you sign and market them? It's definitely opportunity. Uh, you know, we're... Obviously, in the U.S., we have our pockets, and we have people out there where we're signing things all over the place. But, you know, we were chasing acts <coughs> that out of China. China is, is is exploding right now, especially on the urban scene, and we're able to see it through, you know, through YouTube, through through analytics and things like that. And we're watching it happen. But it's you know, it's difficult if you China have, or Asia, China, yeah, and it's difficult if you don't have boots on the ground, right? It, it's culturally different. It's you need people there, but as far as breaking acts here, they overseas, it, it's happening all the time now. It's and we're and, and we're able to see. We can release it. Uh, we released, you know, famous decks, right? All of a sudden, we see that it's exploding in South America, and and we see the analytics, and we're like, okay, we should pour some gasoline down there, invest some money, do some marketing thing down there, maybe get him to go down there, and we're able to see that, which I don't think you, we, labels didn't have that view before, or, or maybe they had the data, but they didn't really know what to do with it, but now that's, it's, 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 it's different. It's, it's the A&R, it's the creative side, but there's also a little bit of a money ball side of it too, where you're looking at analytics and you're able to see these things, wow, why is he doing so well in Australia, you know? Let, let's let's get them to Australia. Let's 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 hire some people locally or whatever it is. And you guys have the ability to do that. Yeah, and we do it. Wondering uh, if anybody out there has any questions that we haven't talked about yet. Any questions, sir? I have one. Uh, it sounds like you kind of stumbled into the music industry because it wasn't really something that you thought about at the beginning. As an undergrad, like with your marketing degree or even before, did you have any kind of musical background? Or was it just like right place, right time? I was lucky. You know, I, like I said, I had no aspirations of being in the music business. Uh, but, you know, the music business is rooted in, in uh, intellectual property. So being in law school and, and really... Uh, Copyright. You know, copyright, trademarks, that was my thing. So, it, it, whether I was going to be in the music business or something else involving trademarks or copyright, uh, but, I, but I got lucky, you know. Th that day when I said, Who, who's Walter Yentnikoff? Is he some Russian musician? The guy could have thrown me out of the office and that would have been it. And instead he gave me that book and he said to come back. And... Once I was in it, I said, wow, this, I get to do this every day? What was your undergraduate degree in? Marketing. Marketing. You know, and like I said, my first job was, was at the New Jersey Devils. Right. And, you know, I got that job because I was walking through a hallway, and they, it, the Devils just moved from uh, Denver, Colorado to New Jersey. They couldn't sell any tickets, and the way you got people into the Meadowlands was you say, come, come see the Rangers, because you couldn't see get into Madison Square Garden. You can see them play against this devil, this Devils team, <laughs> and and that's and we sold tickets and uh, then the season started and then we weren't selling tickets and it was like okay I haven't gotten paid for two months uh, you know now what this is this is it's it's cool but it's it's not that cool you know right yes ma'am um, Tapia who was also a, a Patterson artist. Yep. Um, how did that uh, deal go about, like, sign as far as signing him to 300? He's he's uh he's part of uh, RGS. Yeah, mm -hmm. Fetty's camp, and uh, they brought him to us, and, and it was something that we were interested in, so we signed him. That was that was 
probably in the last year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seth, back. Yeah. Um, you were talking earlier about Young Thug being on the Havana song. Did yeah. you have any, uh, hand, like any handling in that going down and getting him on the song, or did his camp have people that they knew that got him on the song? Or uh, the, the way that went down was uh, Camila's manager is a person called Roger Gold. He's one of the partners at 300, worked at Warner Music. He's one of the, he, he's, he's her manager, and he, wa he needed, he needed uh, someone to rap on the song, and we thought, hey, you should put Young Thug on there, and he thought it was great. We got Thug to, to do the, the part, and, uh, and, it, and it took off. But, you know, a lot of times we're, it, it works both ways. Uh, sometimes we're trying to put people in the, in, in the studio with other artists. You know, that Cheat Code song that we had, we, we got Demi Lovato to do the female part, and it was huge. Uh, you know, it, it, it depends. Sometimes, sometimes there are other record labels will approach us and want people, but it comes from all over the place. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's a girl. I'm a girl. Um, it's okay. <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. All right. It's okay. Um, when you mentioned famous decks earlier, and you were talking about the uh, how when he was like when you finished releasing that album, like he tried to leave, you know, like and go to Interscope because they're op offering like more money or whatever. My question to you um, is, as far as people especially from an urban community coming into the industry, they don't know, have a lot of background as far as how those things go. When they come, like when they sign to a label, is there at any point that they're sat down and they're briefed about what is, ex not, not what is expected of them per se, but like they get, like they learn like how things are supposed to go. Because I feel like a lot of times they're just thrown into it and they don't know that, like they don't know the, the etiquette, they don't understand like how to carry themselves as far as what, you know, what's expected of them. And they yeah. kind of just think it's like, they don't understand like it's levels to doing things and there's a process and you can't just say, all right, I'm done and I'm out. No, like, and, and, it, and it's, it's, it's a process and, and we try to make sure that the artists are surrounded by a good team of people. A lot of times we sign people that it's like, the, the manager is the buddy that they grew up with right, who right. doesn't know anything and it's, it's difficult. It's difficult for us. We'd much rather have a, a seasoned manager who may beat us up a little bit but, but knows the ropes. I mean, we do media training. We, we, it's baby steps. We have artists that are global artists and you know, we signed uh, this kid out of Atlanta, uh, Paper Love, who's, who's, you know, he's never performed live before. He doesn't know how to do an interview. And we have to be conscious of that and train him and, and our expectations are at, at that level where it's gonna take time. But shouldn't, it's the situation she's talking about, shouldn't they have proper representation as a lawyer? Well, guess, they, they all have lawyers. But the lawyer. and, and, and most of the time there's certain lawyers that I don't know how they get them, oh. but it's, there's an act that's popping and it's the same lawyers that are coming in to, for the kill. because they're like not the best as far as you know how they present themselves it's like you know how you you know you're walking in, you're walking into an interview so you're supposed to be ready to engage in conversation and that kind of thing and I you know I have friends that are interested in being in the industry and that kind of that you know that that atmosphere and I'm worried about how they're going to be able to you know become assimilated to that because they literally just think they like it's it's going to be smooth sailing it's like no you have to do sit down you have to do um, you do you, you have you have that to. kind of thing so how do you prepare people that are just like not ready for that we sit them down and say listen we're investing a lot of money for your career and we and and you know it depends what stage they're in you know young acts these are the things you have to do you can't step skip these steps you know, there's acts that explode. Young Thug doesn't do interviews, doesn't like them. So, so we have to figure out a way 
right. to get his message out without doing an interview. And sometimes it's, uh, we'll, we'll record a, a, a script, we'll ask him the question. He doesn't like to, to sit down and do that, you know, and, and we have to deal with that. But, but as far as artists, yeah, they, we, we have people, whether it's marketing people, whether it's Kevin Lyles, that sit down and, and sit with these artists all the time. They, these are the things you have to do. I think when Young Thug released his first record, I think Lior took him on a radio tour because he wouldn't do it. And he basically held his hand and went to every radio station to, to, to get him out there. Uh, you know, it, it really depends, but that's part of our job. And I, I would add that it's not limited just to hip hop or urban artists. My direct experience is working with rock artists or pop artists. They're worse. I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the band Three Doors Down, the song Kryptonite. So Brad, the lead singer, who also happened to be the drummer in the original band, he, I would take him back in the day when MTV mattered, do an interview, and he would do an interview, and he'd answer the question like this. And I had to explain to him that you have to make eye contact. No one ever explained that to him and had to explain, look in the mirror in the morning, and pretend you're answering a question. Or the unfortunate uh, lead singer of the Cranberries band just passed away. Their first album went multi-platinum and they did an interview at MTV and in the cab on the way after the interview, she looked at me and said, well, glad we don't have to ever do that again. And I said, well, if you put on another record, you're gonna have to do all that stuff again. And looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, sometimes the worst thing that happens is that if you- Instant success. success success too quickly and skip all those steps, oh. that, that it's very hard to repeat it because the, the, the artist doesn't, doesn't understand. What do you mean? What do you mean I have to, I have to go and shake every you know, what? radio promotion guy's hand and, and do meet and greets with my fans? And you know, it's all part of it. And uh, I think it's the rare occasion that it's, you skip all that. And, it, and it's the guys that make it that, that do all the things the right way all the way through. Personally, I find the country artists are so much more aware of that and they acknowledge the fans and the people who work at the label and anyone who helps them. They just are so thankful and grateful. Whether they are or not, they certainly act that way. No, I, I agree, and accessible. My times when I worked at Warner Nashville were some of my best years, you know. It's a whole different thing. Drinking whiskey with Blake Shelton, you know, he, he, he used to be just like, I like you, you know, you drink whiskey. I'm like. <laughs> Cool, you know, like I, I don't have, I didn't have that relationship, and I worked for a long time with any other artist, and every guy in Nashville, you know, uh, right, um, you know, I get, I still get, like, like they're my kids that I signed, right. you know, and, yeah. and I get, I get texts from Dan and Shay that say, you know, thank you, still, and they just won some, you know, they were on the ACM awards, right? It's different. It's, it's a whole it's different, it's a whole and, different and it's thing. a smaller community too, right? But it's it's a different mindset than the other artists, you know, getting a pop or rock artist to do a meet and greet, it's, <laughs> it's like pulling nails out, but, you know, it's, it's what it takes. It's what makes the difference between having a relationship, going back to what he originally said, it's a people business and it's about relationships. And whether you're doing a deal or you're trying to get radio play or you're trying to get your song in, in, synchronized in a, in, in a commercial or something, it's all about relationships. And I keep telling people, don't piss off anybody. Don't burn bridges. You know, it's, you never know. One of you could wind up being one of our bosses, you know, 10 years from now. We don't know. No one knows. So you just be nice to everybody in life, and particularly if you're going to go in the entertainment business, know that. I think that's it. Ma'am. Really had much exposure to the music and entertainment industry, um, but I'm currently a business manager. And what happens is every six months they kind of evaluate your. It's a numbers game where I work, so they kind of evaluate how you're doing financially with your business. And if you're not doing well, then you have a six-month period to raise your numbers, and then you, it goes through transitions. And you know that's kind of how they you know keep you or or let you go. Is uh what kind of um like what kind of like how how does it go in the uh, it, at a record label? You know, it, what's it, expected from employees? From employees or from the artists. artists? Well, from employees, like people that work at the record labels. Wow. Well, you know, 
we don't have that many people there, so everybody's gotta gotta contribute. Right. So it, it's not a it's not necessarily about making numbers, but it's about doing your job and uh, and being in it. You know, and, and I could say on the record side, for the artists, it depends. You know, certain genres. You know, rock takes a lot longer to 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 build. Uh, you know, Blake Shelton is a good example. He was an overnight sensation after his seventh record. Seven. You know, he was going to be get cut from the label, and you know, he had a he had a mullet and all this other stuff. And then we got him on on the Voice, and all of a sudden it was like, whoosh, just it just everything clicked. So you know, somebody could have could have cut him. Let me let me say to that, if you're a promotion person, you get a weekly report card. There's uh, there's metrics, media base, sound scan. Uh, Spotify, all these things, and I know when the back in the day when the charts were done Sunday night and Monday morning, you'd be looking at the online metrics and going, "Oh God, we're going to be number two this week, or we're going to be number eleven. How do we get to the next number?" And it's it's not you're going to get fired, but at some point you're held accountable. I mean, how many times can you make an excuse? There's always the the, the structural tension between the A&R guy who signs and says, this is the best thing since sliced bread, and the, and the promotion guy saying, I can't get my friends in the media to, to buy in. And at some point, there's a give and take, because you've got to wake up and say, well, is it always about the music? Well, sure it is. Or is it about your ability to have relationships and deal with it? So there is that, at least in the promotion department. Yeah, that, probably, probably in each department. Is, look, if you're an A&R guy and you never... Sign anything accents. that has any Hit. traction, you're not going to be an A&R guy very long. Although uh, there are A&R guys who make a career of not signing things for a long, long time. Yeah. And that <laughs> well, they only need one, right? And right, you only need, yeah, that's right. And then you're a genius. Yeah. You only need one. So there are metrics that people judge, but it's not like, you've got to make these numbers. No one comes in and says, you better get this thing played on 20 media outlets next week or you're going to be in trouble. I, I, I don't think you can do that. It's, you know, the difference is you're dealing with a tangible product numbers. We're dealing with a very uh, abstract thing called music. Right. And it's, it's something that has to strike a responsive chord in people individually. And if you could quantify that, then you'd be a genius and you'd be making millions if you could figure out how to do that. But none of us have that magic. So we're all trying to do the best we can and provide the infrastructure and support to give that thing the best chance that it can hit people and make them want to either stream it, download it, buy it, or steal it. That's, that's really what you're trying to do. Any, in the back, yeah. So I'm studying accounting and music management here right now. And I'm not really sure where I want to go with it. Like, definitely, like in the music industry, I'm like getting an internship this summer. But like, how like prevalent and how like common are like open jobs for like business managers right now? Like, accountants, or is there like something like you think that like I should like maybe work towards like differently, like with a business degree? I'm kind of like in the no, right look, now. If, if you're grounded in accounting, I mean that, that's that's I think great to great to have. I mean, you think about right now what we're struggling with. There's we get reports accounting from, let's say, Spotify that are like this. They don't know what to do with them, you know. And so there's record companies are now are beefing up on that side of it because now that the money's flowing in, artists want to get paid. So there's going to be a need for for people with accounting backgrounds and and business managers and things like that. Yes. Um, do you find that? You know, in the past couple of years, it's become a little bit better. But with the major labels, I know that artists were kind of afraid to sign with them for a while because they were being pushed to the back burner. So do you find, like, when you're going to push an artist to a bigger label that they're more hesitant because they've been on such a, like, personal label? Well, I mean, I'm pushing them to sign with me, not to another label. So, and, that, and that's part of our... Our pitch is, hey, you, you, you sign with, uh, you know, RCA, they, you don't deliver, they're going to put you on the shelf and then your career's over. Uh, we can't do that. We can't afford to, to write you that check and not at least try. Uh, Plus, you can walk in someone's office there and get an answer. 
try going to see an executive at RCA. Right, right. you know, it, it's, it's, just, it's just us guys, you know, so it's just- 30, 35 people. Right, and, and, the, and the heads of the company, like if you're an artist, you, you, have, you have an issue, you wanna do something, you're gonna sit down with Kevin Lyles or whoever, and they're gonna talk to you. But, you know, I think majors also have, are le and maybe it's starting again, but as they were losing more and more money, before things turned around, they couldn't afford to do that either. It used to be they would sign all these acts and one, you know, one in 10 would have a hit. And if you were the other nine, you were toast. The, the music industry has the largest rate of failure of any industry except one other industry. Wondered if any of you might have thought what that might be other than the music industry having a, a failure rate of over, I'm sure it's over 90%. Pardon? Or restaurant business. Yeah. Toys. Toys. In fact, there are two toy charts. There's a toy chart and there's a toy TV advertiser chart. We always thought if you're looking for the next person to be successful in a music company, maybe look in a toy company because they're used to the failure rate. I don't know if that still holds true. That's kind of old school thinking, but just know the music industry. That's the way it is. The success of one covers the failure of many others. Although at a company like yours, you can't afford to use those numbers. It no. doesn't work. But in a major, that's how it works. All right. You, you know, you, you look at like the history of like Warner Brothers. Oh. You know, they, they put they put out a Green Day record that sells whatever the, it, it covers all the covers all everything all else the or Madonna or whatever it is. It covers everything else. But what happened with them is that as time went on and Taste changed. They were built on all these 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 acts, and once you know, once Madonna left, and once you know, Neil Young stopped selling records, they were left with with nothing. And start all over. Yep. Anyone else? Okay. Well, I did tell Mark that class runs till ten, and I I want to thank him for giving up his evening with his family to come here and and share some thoughts with you guys, and. Uh, Hope you had a, had a good semester, and, I, and I'm sure Mark will stay for a few minutes if any of you wanted to ask him a, a direct question uh, in person. So thanks, and uh, thanks good luck. for having me.